dramatic wave-swept shore, the boundary where two natural realms collide, where land and sea meet in eternal conflict and compromise. Hi, I'm George Page for Nature. This is the magnificent coastline of the Pacific Northwest. Here, cold waters full of nutrients rise up from the deep to meet those of mineral-rich streams flowing down the coastal mountains. Together, they nourish an extravagant diversity of living things. In these cold, fertile waters, many animals actually live longer than those in warmer seas. And as we'll see, some reach gigantic proportions. Even the constant pounding of the waves increases the productivity of our great northwest shoreline. And out there, beyond the breaking surf, there is a world of unseen beauty under the Emerald Sea. A shadow drifts between the darkness and the sun. And watchful eyes mark the passage of a giant, a monarch of a world whose inhabitants may seem as alien to us as those of some strange planet. The creatures which call this world their home come in a startling array of shapes and forms, creatures at once forbidding and beguiling. This is a world of the beautiful and the bizarre, a spectacular showcase of creation. The jagged peaks of the coastal range rise abruptly from the sea along the western edge of British Columbia in Canada, ramparts that mark the end of one world and the beginning of another. Far below, icy streams rush westward, slicing down through glacier-carved fjords to spill their mineral-laden waters into the cold Pacific. Drenched by year-round rains, this land along the western border of the continent boasts great tracts of verdant forests, a shadowed world of giants, unsurpassed for its richness and abundance anywhere on earth. Though little sunlight reaches the ground, Life runs riot in the mossy gloom, and haunting voices, the songs of unseen forest birds, echo through the twilight beneath the towering Douglas firs. A gauzy mist wraps the coast. Sanderlings probe for tiny worms and mole crabs in the backwash of the waves, pausing here to fuel up for the long flight to their nesting grounds high above the Arctic Circle. But sandy beaches are uncommon here. Instead, for hundreds of miles along this northwest coast, crashing waves form a ragged shoreline, pocked with rocky tide pools. Yet surprisingly, the harsh conditions of this zone between the tides are a boon to living things. The waves that flood this splash zone bring rich nutrients from the deep to nourish life on the rocky shores. The endless surge of moving water may discourage would-be predators and help fledgling animals and plants find new sites to colonize.
In the calm between the tides, a giant green anemone extends its stinging tentacles to fish for prey. While on the rocks nearby, other anemones tuck their tentacles inside and wait, along with an ochre sea star, for the rich brine to bathe them once again. Giant California mussels, anchored to the rocks by threads as strong as steel, crowd every inch of open space. With them, gooseneck barnacles wait to feast on morsels brought in by waves. Day and night, through ebb and flood, the shoreline throbs with life, a zone of constant change that tests and shapes all that live within it. As the tides retreat, water is funneled through the narrow coastal inlets, gaining force and fury as it goes. The currents here are among the swiftest in the world, attaining speeds of up to 16 knots. Yet even in these tidal channels, living things find the conditions that promote success. These waters are phenomenally productive, so rich in minute green plants called phytoplankton that the sea itself takes on their emerald hue. The bull kelp, a giant among undersea plants, bends with the current, trailing its blades through the sunlit shallows. The abundance of nutrients makes this a world of giants. Like the kelp, many animals here grow to record size. All benefit from the power of moving water that brings the rich deep sea currents to the surface. Whirlpools form where fast moving water meets a body of slower water. The result is a top to bottom mixing as minerals and dissolved oxygen are swept downward to meet the upwelling nutrients. Like genies that dance in the current, the whirlpools bring life to the dark waters below. Another way the wild energy of the sea helps to fuel the marine food chain. But the sea is ever-changing. In protected bays, the bladders of bull kelp bob like basking animals, dozing on the surface. A raft of thick kelp stalks makes a floating platform for a party of Bonaparte's gulls. Below, a forest to rival the most magnificent forests on land. Lit by pale sunlight, the kelp grove is serene and cathedral-like. Living creatures cling to the kelp for shelter and support. Securely moored to the stalk of this tree kelp, puffy white plumose anemones wait to capture prey from the passing tide.
Kelps of many kinds crowd these brisk waters, like this ribbon kelp common in the shallows. All are forms of brown algae, simple primitive plants that lack both seeds and flowers. They're the fastest growing plants in the world. Some can grow 18 inches in a single day. As a primary producer of carbohydrates, kelp plays a vital role in the food chains of the nearshore waters. And sea urchins are surely among the most eager of all the kelp consumers. Marching on tiny tube feet, a small horde of urchins swarms over a fallen giant, munching its way through the mineral-rich blades. A close-up look at the life in these cold waters dispels the notion that bold, bright colors are confined to tropical reefs. Fuzzy, soft corals form lush gardens here. These creatures so closely resemble flowers that early biologists erroneously classified them as plants. This abundant world where plankton is plentiful and mobility counts for little is a paradise for the vast group of animals called invertebrates, creatures without backbones. Some, like the soft corals, unfurl a web of poison polyps to waylay plankton. But few sea creatures are stranger than the sponges. Among the most primitive of animals, they filter microscopic morsels from the sea. The finger-like form of this sponge is designed to offer minimal resistance to the surging waters. Even the strongest currents find it difficult to dislodge. Giants among the anemone clan, these tall plumos anemones may tower to four feet in height, forming ghostly groves of living animals. The anemones have no need for the rigid bone structure that lends strength and speed to fish and mammals. For most of their lives, they may remain firmly fixed in place, sifting plankton from the moving water. Resembling Grecian columns surmounted by plumes, the anemones are deceptively lovely, for their frills conceal an arsenal of stinging cells capable of injecting poison into any living morsel that drifts their way. Modest relatives of the plumed giants, the crimson sea anemones lay their own seductive snares for prey, beckoning with soft pink arms that pack a deadly poison. Though able to move if they must, these anemones too find little need to travel. For decades, they may cling to the same rock, content to let the currents bring their meals to them. This anemone stings its tiny prey, then hurls it into the flowery mouth in the center of its body. An alluring and superbly efficient predator in action. When it has finished eating, the anemone retracts its tentacles to digest the meal at leisure. The orange sea pen, another surprising kin of anemones and corals. It sinks a fleshy foot into the sandy bottom to serve as a support. 
orienting itself to the current, it picks off plankton from the eddies that flow through its feather-like plume. Like miniature anemones, each polyp is armed with eight tentacles that stun the prey and pass it to the mouth inside the polyp. Reaching three feet in height, the sea pen is one more giant in the Emerald Sea. Like the others, it owes this distinction to the conditions of tide, temperature, and geography, which have made this one of the Earth's richest marine habitats. Fish, too, abound in these waters. But like this red Irish lord, many of the species which make their home near the shore are sedentary bottom dwellers, adept at the arts of deception. Here, another giant, the Puget Sound king crab, its shell a foot across. True masters of concealment, the crabs use whatever they can find for camouflage. A snail shell serves just fine for this little hermit crab. But in deception, none surpasses the decorator crab. With a living garden festooned upon its shell, the decorator crab all but disappears when it settles to a stop on the seafloor. Caught in the open, another decorator crab sports nothing more than a few sprigs of live red algae fixed upon its forehead. For the hermit crab, an empty shell makes a mobile home, useful cover as it combs the seafloor for food. The tiny mouth parts of the crabs flutter nervously, seeking out the subtle vibrations that spell opportunity or peril. Crabs are among the most successful animals in the sea. Unlike vertebrates, crabs wear their skeletons outside their bodies, important external protection in a world of constant danger. Despite its formidable appearance, this spider crab is a strict vegetarian, not a flesh eater at all. Though its diet is primarily kelp, the crab looks like a fierce predator when its territorial rights are threatened. Rearing up to its maximum height, the crusty little crab does its best to appear as menacing as possible, displaying its powerful claws to warn away any intruder. This is a busy world. Every creature here has its own peculiar purpose. A scaled worm, a full eight inches long, hurries on its way, seeking and devouring the scraps of food that have eluded the mouths above.
but no creatures here are more surprising or more spellbinding than the nudibranchs. Nudibranchs are cousins of mussels and common garden snails, but they cast off their shells long ago. Many instead protect themselves with poisonous stinging cells. Some, like this hooded nudibranch, have acquired the ability to swim, a handy skill for hunter or for prey. On the seafloor, a cluster of hooded nudibranchs resembles a bouquet of glass flowers. Restless carnivores, they spread their oral veils to sweep the sea for bits of food. They're called the butterflies of the sea, for like the butterflies on land, many species, such as this orange peel nudibranch, advertise their unappealing taste with bold displays of color. Lacking eyes, nudibranchs rely on minute chemical sensors in their horns to help them find food and avoid their foes. Though some may seem almost capricious in form, each of the several dozen species of nudibranchs here is designed to fill an individual niche in the natural order. With its tentacles sweeping for food, this eolid nudibranch finds a blade of red algae. Wrapping its mouth around the stalk, it scours the surface for tiny animals to eat. The name nudibranch means naked gill, and it refers to the fact that most of these little mollusks have no internal gills, but instead breathe through the fleshy spines called serrate, which adorn their backs. Dazzling variety is the norm among these tiny dragons of the sea. The serrate of this opalescent nudibranch are arrayed in petal-like clusters, while those of the stunning orangeolid suggest the quills of a brightly hued seagoing porcupine. Appearances are deceptive. Though their costumes are like colorful floral displays, most of the nudibranchs are confirmed carnivores. This one, the alabaster nudibranch, cracks open the shells of small snails with its jaws. It prowls the bottom for prey and a little hermit crab takes the precaution of getting out of the way. Though some of the nudibranchs will eat almost anything they can kill, others are specialists.
At a length of more than a foot, the giant nudibranch is as big as they come. And it dines exclusively on the tube-dwelling anemone, when it can catch it. Entrenched within their tubes, the anemones have only one defense, and they resort to it the moment their tentacles sense trouble. In their homes made of slime and sand, the anemones are safe from all but the most carefully mounted attack. Few stray tentacles are the meager reward for all the effort. But the predator tries a new tack. Cautiously, it arches over the top, and then in. Too late, the anemone is safe for now. But the contest between the two will be replayed again and again. So close is the relationship between the giant nudibranchs and the anemones that the predators use the tubes of their prey as an anchor for their eggs. But few among the young nudibranchs are likely to survive the perils that stalk their world. And no predator here is more to be feared than the giant sunflower sea star. Growing to more than three feet across, it's a monster among sea stars. And even the giant nudibranch is careful to avoid it. Fortunately for the nudibranch, when it finds itself in a pinch, it can summon the power to swim. And swim it does, in a majestic undersea ballet. Relatives of sea urchins, sea stars occur in a marvelous array of colors and forms. Although they have no eyes or even brains as we know them, they are predators without parallel in their world. The tiny tube feet of the sunflower sea star 
bear down upon a close relation, a grazing sea cucumber. Under normal circumstances, the cucumber is the most unflappable of creatures. But faced with the prospect of becoming a meal for its giant kin, it calls upon rarely needed escape skills. Still seeking food, the great predator moves on, and an army of green sea urchins scrambles for safety. With its suction-tipped feet clawing the air, the sea star descends on its prey. But the urchins are not without defenses. Hidden among their spines are hair-like stalks tipped with tiny jaws, and each delivers a bite which the sea star can feel. With hundreds of these pincers embedded in its flesh, the predator recoils in pain. The attack concludes. The sea star withdraws. Yet gluttonous as the sunflower sea star may be, it knows better than to tangle with the morning sun star, a species whose diet is devoted exclusively to other sea stars. Though twice the size of the morning star, the big sea star retreats. Moving at a full four feet per minute, the sea star hits its stride the top speed at which a galloping army of tiny tube feet can propel it away. From the air, the sea star's world is a watery maze of islets and channels, a jigsaw puzzle of habitats. This diversity of habitats helps to account for the variety and abundance of life in these northern waters. The deep fjords that indent the coast support a community distinct from that of the current-swept shallows, creatures at home in the twilight below the water surface. Here, jellyfish are in their element. Some 80 species of the gauzy animals, their tentacles armed with stinging cells, pulse on their daily round-trip journeys up to the sunlit surface. then down again into the shadows. A hydromedusa, so delicate that it seems to be part of the sea itself, trawls for prey in the inky darkness. Here at depths of 80 feet or more are found great clusters of cloud sponges, among the most ancient of all the animals in the sea. At seven feet in diameter, these two are giants, living plankton filters, fixed for life to the rocks on which the colony settled hundreds of years ago.
The sculpted chambers of the sponges make ideal condominiums for a host of small sea creatures, among them juvenile rockfish, which find refuge in the many nooks and crannies. Like a chandelier in an old-time movie palace, a colony of sponges lends splendor to these cold, dark waters. And deeper still, fans of Gorgonian corals uncoil their feathery polyps to fish in the rich green depths. Through the silence, a presence moves, a creature whose ways have long been veiled in mystery and legend. the giant Pacific octopus. This one is a seven-footer, but others are reputed to reach an arm spread of 30 feet and a weight of 600 pounds. By any measure, the creature is a true colossus. Relative of the nudibranchs, the mussels, and the garden snail, the giant octopus is one of the biggest of the mollusks and easily the most advanced of all invertebrates. For 2,000 years, folklore and fable have cast the giant octopus in the role of a bloodthirsty killer. But contrary to the myth, the great octopus is a shy, retiring creature, its gentle nature belying its reputation as a man-eater. Far from lying in ambush for ships, the octopus prefers to haunt the groves and canyons of its undersea domain, seeking the crabs and scallops which comprise a large part of its diet. Through a wonder of parallel evolution, the octopus eye is alike in many details to that of the higher vertebrates, including man. And the complexity and capacity of its brain places it at the head of the class among the invertebrates, a predator which may depend for survival less upon instinct than it does upon strategy. The eight arms of the octopus are fitted with suction cups which are capable of clamping onto their prey with tremendous holding power. Legend has it that the arms of the octopus squeeze the life from its victims. But actually, the octopus secretes a poison to paralyze its prey and then devours it.
Like most aquatic animals, the octopus breathes through gills, which continuously absorb oxygen from the seawater pumped over them. The water drawn in through a vent behind the head is expelled through a siphon beneath the neck. If it's necessary to move in a hurry, powerful muscles contract the mantle and push water through the siphon with sufficient force to jet the octopus away from danger. In bright daylight, the lids of its eyes remain tightly shut. But when it stalks the seafloor, its powers of sight help it find its prey. When its suckers are pressed against a surface, they expel water to create a vacuum. When these cups are firmly in place, few creatures, no matter how they struggle, can tear free from their grip. Yet despite its strength, the octopus is cautious in its choice of a foe. With single-minded devotion, the male lingcod guards the eggs which its mate is laid. For the octopus, the lingcod eggs would make a fine meal. It will seize any chance to steal the eggs when their defender is distracted. But this time, the father of the brood is more than ready to defend his own. A quick change artist, the octopus pales to ashy white, a signal to its foe that it's ready for trouble. But the battle is one-sided. The Ling Cod is eager for a fight. Escape is now the sole objective of the octopus. With a jet of ink, it lays down a smoke screen to confuse the fish and cover its retreat. The precious eggs are safe, but just in case, the ling cod escorts the octopus away, delivering for good measure one final nip, as a reminder not to come this way again. The wounds acquired in the brief skirmish will not trouble the octopus for long. In the span of its lifetime, which with luck may stretch for up to five years, there will be many battles and many other opportunities for prey. The giant octopus, of course, is not the only hunter which stalks the floor of this green sea. The wolf eel, in spite of its name, is a fish. But it is a fish of a highly specialized sort, one that has adapted in form and behavior to a basically snake-like way of life. Strictly a cold water dweller, the wolf eel often lives to an advanced old age of 15, and can grow to a length of seven feet or more. Despite their ferocious appearance, wolf eels make doting parents. 
Here the female guards the eggs, visible as the round mass behind her. Remnants of former meals litter the mouth of the den, scraps of sea urchin and scallop, plus the scattered shells of crabs and clams. At the end of a hunting foray, the male returns to the den and takes up his post, ensuring the safety of the eggs from which the next generation of wolf eels will come. With glowering eyes and gaping jaws, he presents a face to deter almost any intruder. His mate, meanwhile, prowls for food, her pectoral fins serving almost as legs to prop her long body up off the bottom. The queen scallop would make a suitable meal, but it's declined. Too small, perhaps, to repay the trouble. But no game is too humble to escape the notice of the most persistent of predators. The strongest shell is no defense against the tenacious grip of the giant sunflower sea star. But the scallop has a strategy for just such a situation. By gulping water and squirting it out, it jets away from one danger only to land in the jaws of another. In the wink of an eye, the shell is cracked open and cast aside to join the remains of the other small creatures who had the misfortune to wind up in the jaws of the wolf of the sea. The final rungs in the food chain belong not to fish, but to mammals, warm-blooded, air-breathing mammals, which throng here to feast on the bounty of fish found in these waters. Stellar sea lions, which may weigh over a ton, haul out in winter on these windswept shores, mingling with their smaller kin, the California sea lions. With plenty to eat, the sea lions grow larger here than anywhere else in the world. Especially in summer, the water is so rich in plankton that visibility is drastically reduced. But the wide saucer eyes of the sea lions serve them well under these conditions. They let in extra light, enabling them to see well, even in the pea soup swirl of plankton. Intelligent and playful, the sea lions seem to enjoy themselves within the hazy blue-green expanses of this northern sea. For the sea lions, life is good along the wild Pacific shore. But there are perils here, and even the heftiest stellar bulls must be ever watchful for the one creature above all others that they fear. killer whale, 
one of the most powerful of all the predators on Earth, an animal whose position is unchallenged at the very pinnacle of the sea life pyramid. The largest member of the dolphin family, the killer whale, or orca, can reach a length of 30 feet and a weight of 10 tons. In intelligence and cunning, it may well outrank all other sea life. Though they are swift and strong enough to prey on sea lions, dolphins, and even on great whales, the orcas gathered in this strait have come to feast on salmon and to socialize. From birth to death, the orcas travel in a close-knit clan, staying in touch by means of a complex system of squeaks, trills, screams, and whistles. Though the orcas have long been feared as man-eaters, no credible evidence exists of deliberate attacks on man. Here on the coast of British Columbia, where they've gathered in great numbers for untold millennia, those who know them best, the coastal Indians, still revere them as guardians and gods, the incarnation of honored chieftains and skillful seal hunters. Each of the more than 300 orcas to be found in these waters can be identified by the distinctive markings on their backs and by the characteristic shape of their tall dorsal fins. Yet despite years of study and observation, far more questions than answers exist about the orcas and their way of life. It's well known that their high-frequency clicks function as a kind of sonar to help them find their prey. But precisely how this works remains a mystery. The Emerald Sea is a world of giants and of unsuspected marvels. But all this wondrous life, from the smallest crab to the mighty orca, depends upon a fragile balance a fortunate mix of circumstances which could all too easily be disturbed. Human vigilance and care could guarantee its survival. It may take the best of all our efforts to ensure that this treasure store of wonders we call the Emerald Sea will endure in all its splendor. even remotely dangerous to man. And finally, one last species you don't have to worry about. The most impressive thing about it is its name, Heterodontus portus jacksoni. It's the Port Jackson shark of Australia, another harmless shallow water fish. And so we come to the shark-shaped sharks, the ones that understandably inspire terror. Other animals may be equally dangerous, but what else looks so menacing? The torpedo shape, the classic undershot jaw, the ominous dorsal fin knifing through the surface. Combined, these features seem to embody the very essence of potential violence. It is these sharks we will be studying at close, sometimes very close, quarters. Thank <laughs> you. 
An important center of shark study is Rangiroa Atoll in the Pacific. But years before the scientists got here, Rangiroa was known as a place where man and shark had learned to live in peaceful, if uneasy, coexistence. Six years ago, a shark almost completely tore the calf muscle from the right leg of this Polynesian spear fisherman. Yet he continues to fish for his living because men and sharks have been fishing these same reefs together for years. And the men regard a shark attack as nothing more than an unlucky accident. They believe the chances of it happening again are very slight. A lifetime of close contact with sharks has convinced these fishermen that contrary to common belief, shark behavior is predictable and you can avoid attack if you obey the rules. One of the most important rules that has to be obeyed concerns the handling of speared fish whenever sharks are around. The struggles of even a small fish can attract a shark, so get the catch to the surface quickly. Get under cover of the boat as soon as possible. These are elementary and obvious precautions. More important is the fact that the fishermen have come to recognize, through years of experience, when a shark means trouble. They can tell by its body posture and the way it moves in the water. Those are remoras, shark suckers, hitching a ride behind the dorsal fin. Of course, an occasional fish has to be sacrificed to the rival fisherman. Man and shark may be equals, but the shark is clearly a little more equal than the man. Well, it's a small price to pay for coexistence. Over the past several years, scientists Don Nelson and Richard Johnson have been testing scientifically the same theories of shark behavior that the Rangiroa fishermen discovered by instinct. The first species this team encountered is extremely active at night, an eerie time to go looking for a shark that averages eight feet in length. The reef white-tip shark is extremely well equipped with strong cutting and sawing teeth. It also has an inquisitive and persistent nature. It must therefore be treated with respect, though there are few records of the white-tip attacking man. It tends to hunt the bottom layers for small fish and octopus. On the reefs off Rangiroa, it is partial to coral caves. As we'll soon see, a shark that means to be aggressive usually gives quite definite signs. But these white tips are swimming in a completely normal and relaxed fashion. So lesson number one is that by no means all of the deadly looking sharks are really as dangerous as they look. Of course, it has to be admitted though, that the sharks in this night dive weren't exposed to any feeding stimuli, which might well have affected their attitude and made them far less placid. Even now, the scientists are planning an experiment that does include feeding stimuli and involves a far more dangerous collection of sharks.
sharks do not seem to be territorial or to defend a given part of a reef. However, the scientific team discovered through telemetry that they're much more regular in their habits than previously suspected. Telemetry means attaching small ultrasonic transmitters to the subjects of the experiment. With a shark, there's only one way to do this, persuade the fish to swallow it. Don Nelson inserts the transmitter inside a dead bait fish. The mouth of the fish is sewn up and soon, with luck, the shark will be sending out underwater signals. The rest of the equipment consists of a receiver and an underwater directional hydrophone. The signals transmitted by the shark can be picked up through a mile or more of water. And here's the intended mobile underwater broadcasting station, a gray reef shark. Out in the channel between the islands frequented by grays, the transmitter-equipped fish is attached to a float and lowered over the side. One of the diving team goes down to supervise the pickup. The receiver is switched on. And a gray reef shark moves in. Though sharks tear at large prey, they swallow small fish whole. Small transmitters, too, with any luck. The bait is seized. The first shark just takes the tail. Now stimulated by the feeding activity, the other greys move in. This, too, is a moment the divers have learned to watch. At Rangiroa, greys have attacked more fishermen than any other species. But this time, they display none of the body attitudes that warn of an impending attack. At last, a gray swallows the head of the bait containing the transmitter and makes off with it. Telemetry of this and other gray reef sharks in the channel at Rangiroa has revealed some astonishing things about the regularity of their habits. Grays, which often hunt in packs, seem to lead a solitary life on occasions. One individual spent each part of his day in a different location, moving regularly and on time to his next point of call. In the case of the transmitter we've just watched being swallowed, Don Nelson was able to get a fix on the shark and follow it for some distance. Let's circle around. When the signals finally indicated that the researchers had caught up with the transmitting shark, the team found the fish had led them to an entire squadron of greys at a location they'd never suspected to be occupied. The shark's sensory organs are what makes them such efficient killers, so it's vital to understand how they work and what they respond to. One of the major stimuli that leads sharks to their prey is sound, the sort of low-frequency noises made by a struggling or wounded fish. Here, the team prepares to create such sounds electronically and within range of a gathering of sharks. Sharks have a built-in seek-and-destroy weapon system. They come with incredibly efficient prey detection devices. By means of a complex system of hearing organs in the head and sensitive nerve endings along the center of their flanks, sharks can detect both long and short range sounds up to a distance of several hundred yards. Because of the artificially created sounds, this is potentially a very dangerous situation. 
The men are deliberately trying to stimulate the sharks with totally unpredictable results. Grays gradually move in and become more curious and excited. Then comes the moment for which the divers must watch, the aggressive display which often precedes an attack. It is betrayed by a series of exaggerated swimming movements. Watch that gray in the background. The swimming action doesn't look very significant until you break it down and analyze it. Note that lift of the snout and the arching of the back. See the way the pectoral fins point stiffly downward. Johnson and Nelson call this an agonistic display. Of course, the aggression may be directed at another shark, but it's a warning to the diver, either to stay still or to back away slowly. Hurried flight is likely to trigger an attack. Sharks have extremely well-developed senses of taste and smell. When a bundle of dead fish is fixed to the seabed, they can detect the smell from a great distance and soon home in on the target. With sharks excited by both sound and smell, it was time for the diving team to move on to a safe distance. A feeding frenzy can develop in a very short time with reef white tips, black tip reef sharks and greys all joining in. In this situation, even comparatively harmless species can lash out in competition with each other or at any diver that gets in the way. At times like this, there's probably no such thing as a harmless shark. Sharks look like airplanes, World War II fighter planes to be exact. There's a good reason for this, because a shark must perform almost precisely like a fighter. The upturned snout, the wing-like pectoral fins and raised tail provide lift, and the streamlined shape is designed for speed. They're the fastest of all fish. Blues like this have been clocked at an astounding 43 miles per hour. As a predator, the blue is equipped with all the wonderful hunting devices that sharks have evolved over 350 million years. That large, malevolent eye gives fair sight, especially in dim light. Nasal pits detect smells more dilute than one part per million. Along the flank, this is a mako, there's a row of nerve endings and sensitive pits called the lateral line. These can detect movement of prey at close ranges. Motive power comes mainly from a tail whose upper lobe is usually far larger than the lower one. 
The downward drive of this causes the shark to plane forward on its flattened undersurface and wing-like pectoral fins. To document the shark's amazingly precise sensory equipment, our camera team moved east to the Channel Islands off the California coast. Here, in the waters off San Diego, the sea is warm enough to suit several species of sharks. And the waters are rich in underwater vegetation and in the fish life which provides the basic food for the sharks. California sea lions hunt in the giant kelp beds. Sea lion mothers are no lovers of sharks. There is at least one species here, the mako, that eats their pups. Fear of sharks is a possible reason for this sea lion cow's aggressiveness to the camera. So these were the waters in which the team was going to work. The shark cage was necessary because you can never quite be sure, 60 miles off San Diego, what's going to turn up. In charge of photography was Stan Waterman, and behind him, Chuck Nicklin and Howard Hall, all extremely experienced in working with sharks. Clarice Prang, a young scientist studying locomotion and the bite power of sharks, joined the team. The safety cage was able to ascend and descend like an elevator by means of compressed air. Attracted by baiting with oily dead fish, a very large blue shark was early on the scene. It's always a gamble whether sharks are going to turn up when you want them. Once one fish comes to the bait, or chum, others are likely to follow. So the whole photographic team goes over the side to meet their guests. This is dangerous work, and everybody knows it. So along with the camera team and scientists, the group includes safety men whose sole job is to watch out for an unexpected attack. They are armed with explosive powerheads called bang sticks, capable of killing a shark on contact. These transparent Chinese lanterns are primitive organisms called colonial salps. Some authorities believe that salps were one of the first creatures to have a primitive backbone which would make them ancestors of all vertebrates, sharks and man alike. On the very first dive, the team struck it lucky. Big blues detecting the smell of the chum began to show up in considerable numbers. are in an eating mood and that can mean danger when excited in a feeding frenzy they are likely to lash out 
People once thought a shark had to roll over before it could bite because of its undershot jaw. Not true. Its movable jaw makes the shark a highly efficient biter. When a school of food fish appears, the guards keep an extra sharp lookout. The attitude of the apparently docile blues could change. Even so, the cage is basically not to escape from them. But this is something different, a potentially lethal hammerhead. The shark that wears its eyes on stalks has a bad reputation for attacking man. This hammerhead is about 10 feet long. The horizontal plane on which the eyes are mounted doesn't hinder the hammerhead when it comes to biting. The hammerhead soon fades away, but the unpleasant character who follows it has come to stay, a big mako. This is what the team had been hoping to film and the reason they had brought the safety cage, a wise precaution when you look at those teeth. As soon as the Mako arrived on the scene, several sea lion cows appeared, as if to keep their eye on the big killer who sometimes snatches their pups from around the nearby islands. For a diver, a shark feeding frenzy is a thing to stay well clear of. The excited feeding activity that follows was created by heavy baiting with dead fish so that it could be mainly filmed in safety from the surface. It illustrates a number of fascinating things about shark behavior. That's a blue attacking the basket containing the chum. Watch the swimming action, the large upper lobe of the tail driving the shark on those wing-like pectoral fins. Note the typical seizing, shaking, and sawing action of the bite. Keeping close to the cage, the team filmed some of the action with the blue sharks from underwater. Look at this, a frenzied blue actually takes a bite out of another blue. This shark wasn't going to let go at any price, even risking being hauled out of the water. Watch the jaw open to snatch that fish head. When the water becomes clouded with fragments of tissue and blood, the sharks appear like vultures on a kill. Blues so far, but suddenly there's a stranger in their midst, a mako. Note the more evenly sized upper and lower lobes of the tail, the shorter jaws armed with some particularly ferocious teeth. And here, in a small mako, are those teeth. Shark teeth are only loosely attached and must be replaced constantly. Many sharks will go through at least a thousand teeth in a lifetime. Diver Steve Early got raked across the head by a shark during this filming sequence. Luckily, only his wetsuit hood was damaged. To kill a shark was the last thing the team wanted, but they had to recognize that the safety of the men was paramount. Maintaining security was becoming more and more difficult.
This was one case when a Mako came too close for comfort. And the bang stick seals its fate. The safety man had to make an instant decision to fire his power head. There's no bullet in it, simply a large powder charge. A number of the sharks bore large wounds, which were almost certainly the result of attacks by their own kind during feeding frenzies. That's an unusual species of remora, or shark sucker, attached to this badly scarred blue. Here was one of the most amazing aspects of the California study. Actually hand feeding an open sea wild shark. Please don't ever try this yourself. This job is strictly for the pros. Anyone who wishes to discourage unwelcome attention from a shark is advised not to grab it by the fins. Even a small fish is too strong to hold, and it's apt to get angry. A safer way to deal with a boisterous shark is to seize it by the nose. This one temporarily went limp. Richard Johnson, one of the team's advisors, advocates banging an attacking shark on the nose as a last resort. The nose is where many of its sensory systems are concentrated. But as will soon become abundantly clear, the best way to deal with a shark is to keep as far away from them as possible. A lot remains to be learned about how and why sharks attack. Such information could someday help the survivors of shipwrecks and air disasters. The time had come to begin a series of experiments which were the true purpose of the expedition. The first experiment concerned the means by which sharks hunt down their prey, human or otherwise. The object of the experiment was to test the relative strengths of the three main feeding stimuli, smell, sound, and sight. First, for smell. This container was packed with oily fish bits, whose effect on sharks has already been seen. Big makos were soon on the spot. So were the big blues. Beyond the fish bits is a container holding a transmitter of low-frequency sounds that will resemble the vibrations made by a struggling or wounded fish when it's turned on. The waving white object is a visual attractor, a dummy squid. Squid are a particular shark delicacy. Which of the three known shark attractors would achieve the most response? The electronic fish begins its simulated sounds. At the first attempt, a number of sharks arrived and milled around indiscriminately. This was thought to be because too much fish oil had accidentally been released. The next day, the experiment was tried when there were known to be no sharks in the immediate area. The result, though far from conclusive, was more interesting. A single blue arrived. It approached the sonar device. 
Then it headed for the fish-baited lure, attracted by the oily smell. It knows this for some time. Then it made off as if to inspect the other baits. Having circled the visual signal, and apparently dismissed it, it becomes strongly attached to the audio imitation of a struggling fish and actually mouthed the transmitter. Of course, such tests have to be carried out at length and with many different species, but this blue shark does seem to suggest that it finds the sound of a wounded fish irresistible. It doesn't care for the visual enticement of the beckoning squid. This backs up the belief that shark's eyesight is used mainly in the initial approach. Unless it then finds attractive sounds or smells, it probably doesn't stay around long. Scientist Clarice Prang's study concerns shark locomotion, the precise manner in which they swim, as well as the bite power of their jaws. She worked mainly from inside the cage. She takes her bulky, slow-motion camera from a teammate. To give her the close-up she needed, the baits were attached directly to the outside of the cage, one of them containing a bite gauge. Right away, Clarice began to wonder who was watching whom. Chuck Nicklin adjusts the fish inside which a bite measurer has been planted. The device consists of a metal rod surrounded by ball bearings. The amount by which the rod is dented by the ball bearings gives a reading in pounds per square inch of force exerted. Soon the area is thick with sharks. It's typical of sharks that they circle the prey, getting closer and closer as their confidence builds. Another piece of behavior that divers would do well to remember. Eventually, when the circle gets small enough, they'll move in for the kill. In this case, it's the closeness of the bait to the cage that is upsetting them. But as will be seen, they eventually overcome their apprehension. comes the first attack on the bite gauge. Watch how the membrane closes over the shark's eye, presumably to protect it from debris in the water. This big blue has taken an ordinary fish bait, but the nearer one has got a second bite gauge. The tube can be seen nearly out of the fish as the shark shakes the bait. In fact, this small blue was more intent on shaking than biting, and eventually shook the gauge right out of the fish. Chuck Nicklin was able to retrieve the gauge in order to load it inside another bait.
While he did so, he was besieged by sharks practically storming the cage to get at the baits. This blue has the tail end of one of the fish it has just swallowed sticking out of a gill slit. On the last day of filming off San Diego, the big makos grew bold enough to turn up in force around the cage. The bite gauge was waiting for them, and it wasn't long before they joined in the attack. These mako bites were later analyzed. The tips of the shark's teeth were found to have exerted an incredible pressure of 8,000 pounds per square inch. To me, there's something elemental and profound about the shark. That it could have survived over so many millions of years with so little change from its original form suggests that it is one of nature's most perfect designs. Now, at long last, the scientists are taking a closer look at this wonderful animal, which is all to the good. Because the more we know about these and any other creatures, about their place in nature and their relationship to man and other animals, the less we need fear them. And the less we need fear them, the less we will be compelled to destroy them. This is Peter Benchley. Good night. While sharks are undoubtedly among the largest and most voracious predators in the sea, they're by no means the only ones you're likely to run into when you're out there with your diving gear. As a matter of fact, the ocean floor is a hotbed of aggression, seething with thousands of different bloodthirsty hunters 
determined to track down and eat thousands of other watchful quarry. It can be a real war zone. As an example of what you're likely to find beneath the seas, we've selected a seemingly placid underwater beauty spot in the Great Barrier Reef off Australia. The divers here are Ben and Eva Croft, wildlife cinematographers, who have been diving on this particular part of the Great Barrier Reef for several years. They know it almost as well as their own hometown on the Queensland coast. Back on the surface, diving assistant Bob Dixon tends the compressor and the airlines as the crops go visiting old friends below. The batfish are large and friendly, at least to humans. They're always around when anyone decides to swim in the area. The reef, their hunting grounds. This yellow trumpet fish is a skilled and deadly hunter. It doesn't move far from base, but when it goes cruising after prey, it sometimes lies close to another species, the big Maori cod, for instance, using them as a stalking horse, creeping along behind a better camouflaged fish. They're a menace to any small fry in the area, with a deadly suction device to vacuum up potential victims. Occasionally, the trumpet fish stops off at a patch of green weed called turtle grass, in which it apparently enjoys grooming itself, perhaps to brush off parasites. Trumpet fish come in different colors. The newcomer, for all its different costume, is the same species. The two swim together in what is probably a courtship ritual. Virtually every coral head around the world has its moray eel. Morays have a particularly vicious look and a bad reputation which isn't really justified. They show their teeth a great deal, but this is because they need a continuous flow of water through their mouths to breathe. Morays occasionally bite divers who insist on poking fingers into their hiding places. But if they're unprovoked, they tend to be rather docile creatures. This moray eel has become used to friendly visits from Eva Croft. Perhaps one of the most industrious and certainly one of the most intriguing inhabitants of the reef are the small, cleaner fish. They make their living by removing the parasites that infest the bodies of various reef dwellers. They're a species of wrasse. All these cleaner wrasse start life as females, and the largest one in the group undergoes a sex change and becomes a male. If he dies, the next largest female changes her sex. Truly an amazing system. One of the reef's most formidable basement dwellers is the remarkable creature called a wobegon. It always reminds me of a sort of ocean-going Oscar the Grouch. We met one briefly in the shark film. Though they grow to eight feet long, wobegongs are usually harmless to humans. They lie on the bottom, superbly camouflaged by the tassel-like growths around the mouth that resemble seaweed. Not to mention the dappled spots that perfectly match groups of coral polyps. Thus hidden, they ambush small fish and devour bottom-living mollusks and crustaceans. This occupant of the antlered coral has a famous means of avoiding capture. When disturbed by Eva Crop, it sets off the inky smoke screen for which the octopus is well known. Another predator, the tusk fish, has enormously strong teeth for crushing crabs and mollusks. This one moves large lumps of coral and shifts quantities of sand with its pectoral fins 
in his unending search for food. The stonefish is one of the most dangerous creatures living on the reef. Those dorsal spines can inject a powerful venom that can kill. It matches its background perfectly. The stonefish alone is reason enough for the basic rule among divers, look but don't touch. A coral trout approaches the stonefish but gets warned off. If the stonefish is the ugliest reef dweller, its poisonous relation, the fireworks fish, or butterfly cod, is one of the most beautiful. Those fins look like delicate feathers, but woe betide any diver that gets too close. They too inject a poison which causes excruciating pain. This banded goby has set up house in the sand with a couple of little crayfish. There must be something in it for both of them. The goby gets a hole, and the crayfish get a lookout, and a bodyguard, and maybe scraps from the goby's meals. Giant manta rays call in on the reef, and they often stay around for a while. This manta is just on a flying visit, winging through the blue-green haze like a gigantic delta wing bomber that has learned to flap its wings. Manta are sometimes called devil rays, but in fact they're completely harmless to humans. Like many of the largest marine creatures, including most whales, they live by scooping up plankton. The rafts have found a customer, and they are busy cleaning a sea trout. It's a symbiotic relationship that benefits both partners. The coral trout gets cleared of the parasites that infest its mouth and gills, and the wrasse gets a free meal. <laughs> As you can see, for the wrasse, it's something of an act of faith. As the old Flemish proverb puts it so simply and so profoundly, big fish eat little fish. <laughs> Thanks for being with us today. I hope you'll join us. to get into battle to win the big bucks. I don't know if this records, but it's madness. People are shooting at each other there. Quite a few rammings and collisions, but... Hang on! Hang on. No rules. Anything goes. Welcome to the war zone, Bristol Bay, Alaska, where the battle's over salmon. Money! <laughs> That's what every one of these babies means, is money. Ken Kane of Bellingham is captain of one of the nearly 2,000 fishing boats that fight each year for a slice of the $200 million sockeye salmon pie. Yeah, I'm hoping to make 150000 this year, you know. That's the main reason. We're not up here for fun, you know. It's the modern-day version of the Alaska Gold Rush, where the treasure is salmon. It's a short three-week season that can make or break a fisherman like Ken. In the past, shots have been fired, boats rammed, whatever it takes to make this important catch. Peak of the season, all winter time thinking about it. 
Preparing for it. Yeah, banking on it, hoping. Ken will have plenty of aggressive competition to contend with. Like Ken, most fishermen fight for their catch here at a place called the line. There's not a lot of room, and it's new fish coming in here, so everybody comes down here and battles it out. The line is the boundary of the legal fishing area. Since it has the most fish, it also attracts the most boats. Boats with macho names like Bristolizer, Force 5, Ready Mix, all battle with Ken for the best place to lay their nets. Let her go! Well, the line is right here, but... There's another risky challenge to fishing the line. Wardens flying overhead can find you big bucks if your net drifts over the boundary. He's looking to write $10,000 tickets. Why? Go over this line one hair and you're busted. But Ken has more immediate problems to deal with. Spotting the fish heading toward Ken's net, another fisherman has laid his net directly in front of Ken's. It's called getting corked. I mean, guys will cork their own mother for 10 fish down here. If your net's really hitting, you know, and you're, you're loading up and somebody lays it right in front of you, you know, it's just like taking it out of your pocket, you know. See, that guy's got fish over there, and we don't. Disappointed with the first catch, He'll deliver this load, hoping for better luck in a couple of hours. He figures the first catch will bring in $8,000, but at Bristol Bay, that's just a drop in the bucket. Shortly after delivering the load, yeah, Ken gets word of new action back on the line. So we're trying to get down there, we're trying to hurry. Bad weather has moved in and time is running out. The race back to the line is on. Gotta get back there, though. I can't go fast enough, you know? Wanna get back there and get the net in. The rough seas hide fishermen's nets from view. Ken tries to dodge them, but it's too late. God dang it, there's another one. The boat's propeller has hooked a net. Ken's relieved to find no major damage to his propeller. The net's owner is none too pleased. We just a little well. we the crew again. moves on, having dodged that bullet. They arrive at the line and find it thick with boats and salmon. Looking good. They waste no time dropping the net. Just trying to keep from getting corked. We got a good opening here. Ken's net begins filling with fish, and other boats quickly move in to try to steal the catch. Oh, that guy's corking us, that Russian. As soon as he saw our net, he started hitting with fish. Hang on! Hang on! Ken decides to scare the fish into his net before the competition snares them away. Okay, let's do it. Look at him skimming down the cork line. Smoke, baby! His move pays off. Look at that net. It is choked out there. It's a huge catch that helps put him halfway to his $150,000 goal with half of the season left. Pretty good. Feel like I want to get a pick and get back up there and get some more. More salmon, more net profit. From a place where riches lurk just beneath the surface. Bristol Bay Gold. Bristol Bay Gold.